warm African welcome to day one of the fourth East African Banking and Microfinance Forum 2021. To our returning participants, it is good to see you again. And to our new participants, it's great to have you on board. This two-day event brings together practitioners from across the financial services sector to deliberate on topical issues facing our region. It has now grown to attract more than 600 registrations from over 40 countries, 23 of which are in Africa. And we thank you for the support. Hopefully you've taken a moment to explore the firm's online platform, SwapCard, where program, speaker profiles, and other information is readily available. To connect with speakers during a session, just click on the live discussion button at the bottom right of your screen. You may also access the attendee tab in the main menu to connect with fellow delegates and arrange meetings. Last year, the theme of the forum was banking at a time of global crisis, perspectives, challenges, and opportunities. This theme reflected the situation that we were all facing following the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. What started off as a public health crisis evolved into one of the most significant global socioeconomic shocks of our time with ripple effects across all aspects of human life. With the benefit of hindsight, which some say is a perfect science, it has become clear that resilience is a key competency in the new operating environment as enterprises seek to chart the way forward in the midst of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Many want to build back better. The million dollar question is how? For this reason, our theme this year is gearing up for recovery and growth, building a more resilient banking sector. And so the various sessions that you will attend over the next two days are designed to address the challenges affecting the financial services sector in general and the banking and microfinance industry in particular. Topics range from digital transformation and the role of capital markets to green financing and climate change. Delegates are encouraged to take full advantage of the rich menu that is laid before you. This event is one of the fruits of the strong partnership between the Eastern and Southern African Trade Development Bank, TDB, and the European Investment Bank, EIB. TDB is a regional multilateral financial institution that has celebrated 35 years of delivering impact across multiple sectors in its member states. Today, we are honored to have the executive leadership of the institution with us. Accordingly, it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Masu Tedese, TDB President Emeritus and Group Managing Director, to give his opening remarks. Welcome, Mr. Tedese. Thank you very much, uh, James Wambugu, our Masters of Ceremonies. Good morning and warm welcome also from myself to all the participants, audience from around the 40 or so countries that we've heard are participating in this forum. I'd like to give uh, special recognition to my good colleague from the European Investment Bank, Mr. Thomas Ostros and Paolo Lombardo, who's the regional representative based here in Nairobi. And I'd also like to recognize Professor Njuguna Ndungu, the executive director of the Africa Economic Research Consortium, also based here in Nairobi. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to the captains of our industry in banking, the CEOs of the various commercial banks, DFIs, MFIs, all present in this forum as well. Thank you for being with us as well on your end. You've heard from uh, Mr. James Wambugu, our master of ceremonies, that the theme of this particular forum is about resilience and it's about recovery and growth. These are themes that are very, very important given where we're coming from in the pandemic. Those of you who follow global economic statistics will have noticed that the bounce has come quite nicely in 2021. We're expecting the, the global economy to, to bounce to about 6% growth this year. Africa is going to be bouncing at about half that level, which is roughly 3.4%. And fortunately, East Africa will be doing a little bit better than that at about 4%. But this uh, this actually reveals the, the reality that Africa has not had much of a stimulus. Some countries like South Africa, of course, have had the benefit of very significant stimulus, uh, up to 10% of GDP in the case of South Africa, but most African countries have not had much of a stimulus. 
And so this is why the international partnerships around Africa's growth and development is very important. And we're very pleased that at least the international community has come to the party in some ways this year. We've seen uh, very bold initiatives coming through from the IMF. We're all very proud of the managing director there, Kristalina Georgieva, who's really shown great leadership in this pandemic, but also the World Bank and the European Investment Bank and others who've also geared up to, to really put their weight behind Africa's efforts to, to really double down on the recovery. We do come from the banking sector, and the banking sector, of course, naturally has had a lot of stress. And we'll be discussing some of those uh, very difficult issues that we've had to grapple with in the past year. We'll also be discussing some of the trends that have come through very strongly during this period. There have been some silver linings in the clouds. We've seen the acceleration of digital transformation, given the challenges that we've all faced, even at TDB as a wholesale bank that doesn't have retail operations. We've also embraced the digital transformation uh, wave in a very big way to do business uh, very differently. What we've also seen uh, risks that have come with that, which is, of course, heightened cyber risks around security and cyber crime. We've all tried to up our games in, in that regard as well. So we'll be hearing bits and pieces around that. And of course, there's the, the, the big push to recover some of the credit losses that had manifested during 2020. So these are going to be some of the trends in the industry that we'll be discussing in the context of uh, the bigger mega trends that the world is, is engaging uh, with as we speak today. We know that uh, COP26 is still happening uh, at the global level in Glasgow. It's, uh, it's a big, it's a very big global issue that we're all trying to contribute to, to resolving in some way. And, and there will be some, uh, some very uh, exciting initiatives coming out of Glasgow that will allow us all to feel that there's much more than talk happening, but there will be some serious action, including uh, fun funding flows that will allow us to pursue a green Build Back Better agenda. Uh, greening our, our, our financial systems is going to be an important part of, of, of the recovery and the agenda going forward. On that note, I'd like to just once again thank the European Investment Bank for this great partnership we've had. This is the fourth edition in this forum. We've had uh, quite a bit of success in bringing together great minds in the industry and various partners, even beyond the banking and financial sector. We've had the, even the United Nations and other UN agencies, uh, such as UNECA, uh, participating in some of these events. We have banking associations and all sorts of other uh, important stakeholders. And this is, of course, because we've managed to create such an exciting uh, platform. Uh, TDB, of course, is uh, happy to, to be participating throughout these two days. You'll be hearing from some of my steam leaks. On the various sessions, uh, we have Michael Awari, the deputy CEO of the bank, uh, together with uh, James Kabuga from our TDB Academy and several others who will be speaking uh, during the course of the two days. So on that note, I'd like to once again thank you all for coming through to this uh, forum in this hybrid format. We are quite a few of us here physically in person, uh, so don't think that this is just a repeat of last year. We are slowly, slowly coming back to a more physical, interactive world. Thank you and good luck in the sessions ahead. Thank you, Mr. Desse, for sharing those opening remarks. You've highlighted resilience, recovery, and growth, and the role of international partnerships in providing the stimulus needed across Africa in general and East Africa in particular, and also the need to green our economies going forward. As mentioned, this forum is the fruit of a strong partnership between TDB and the EIB. The EIB is the lending arm of the European Union. It is a leading multilateral financial institution globally and one of the largest providers of climate finance. Accordingly, I am honored to invite to the podium Mr. Paolo Lombardo, head of regional representation for the EIB to share some thoughts as he introduces the EIB vice president, Mr. Tomas Ostros. Welcome, Mr. Lombardo. Thank you. Thank you, James. 
Group Managing Director, uh, Tadase, uh, Professor Ndongo, colleagues of the Trade Development Bank, dear East African partners, dear EIB colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the fourth edition of EIB's uh, East Africa Banking and Microfinance Academy for 2021. As I'm due to speak again tomorrow, uh, I will be brief today. Also, my vice president will be speaking shortly after my intervention. I had the pleasure of attending this conference twice in my previous incarnation as head of risk at the EIB. Today, I'm here as in a different capacity as head of EIB's uh, regional representational office for East Africa. At each event, I've witnessed vibrant discussions and first class interventions. I have no doubt that this fourth edition will be no different. So I wish you all a very fruitful and intense, intense exchange over the next few days. Allow me now to introduce my vice president, Mr. Thomas Olstrom, to give his opening remarks. Over to you, vice president. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to warmly welcome you all to the annual Banking and Microfinance Forum, which we have, which we have been running since 2018 and co-hosting with our valued partners, Trade and Development Bank, since 2019. We have now come to our fourth consecutive East Africa edition, in spite of all the challenges that we are currently facing, but united in our common goal, that of gearing up for recovery and growth by building a more resilient banking sector, which is the theme of this year's forum. Our partnership with Africa in terms of sustainable development dates back to 1963. Over the past 10 years, the EIB has provided more than 26 billion euros of funding in 52 African states. In 2020, it made 5 billion euro available for new private and public investment in Africa, a record annual commitment for the bank, by also helping the continent to deal with the immediate health emergency and mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic while addressing the economic effects of the crisis. This amount of EIB financing will generate more than 12 billion euros of investments in 28 African countries, with 70% of the funds going to countries in fragile and conflict situations and to some of the least developed economies. Since the beginning, the EIB's financial sector operations on the continent have had two complementary objectives – to promote the development of the financial sector and to improve the access for finance for private companies. Our credit lines indeed contribute to better access to long-term resources and to strengthen the balance sheet of our partner financial institutions. Most of our intermediated loans are implemented in partnership with commercial banks, which in turn target the private sector companies, in particular small and medium-sized enterprises and micro-enterprises. This financial intermediation has more recently been deployed by the EIB along thematic credit lines in order to promote priority areas common to both our partner countries and to the European Union. For example, targeting climate mitigation and adaptation activities, the financing of green projects, women economic empowerment, digitalization or support agriculture and smallholder farmers, all of which aim at maximizing impact and bring about inclusive and sustainable growth. As part of our Team Europe effort, these EIB thematic credit lines can also be combined with the European Commission grants to cover partial guarantees and technical assistance, which enable banks to mitigate part of their risk while optimizing their impact. During this forum, my colleagues will inform you about the different products the EIB offers to meet the private sector funding needs. These include direct loans and direct equity investments, intermediated loans to banks and microfinance institutions, as well as investment in private equity or venture capital funds. The bank also uses Team Europe innovative risk-sharing products to catalyze private sector finance or enhance impact by targeting a specific group of communities or more vulnerable segments of society. 
A significant part of the loans granted by the EIB, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is denominated in local currencies, such as the Kenyan shillings, to facilitate the offer of longer-term loans on competitive market-based rates. An example of this is the Kenya Agriculture Value Chain Facility of 50 million euros, which we are extending to the Equity Bank in Kenyan shillings. The facility will support investment made by private sector agribusinesses that promote the integration of smallholder farmers into the agricultural value chain. It is complemented by an EU grant, which is partly used to reduce the intermediary's hedging cost of a currency swap arrangement and to cover their capacity building requirements through technical assistance. To further support private sector lending in the region, the EIB has allocated an umbrella SME regional facility of up to 150 million euros, under which a first allocation has been made of 30 million euros to DFCU Bank in Uganda, where at least 30% of the loan will be deployed towards enterprises impacting positively on gender equality and on women's economic empowerment. Last year, due to the adverse economic circumstances brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, the EIB stepped up its intermediated SME financing to also cover work and capital funding and investment needs resulting from the lack of consumer demand and the significant disruption of supply chains. It therefore set up three COVID-19 rapid response regional facilities for Sub-Saharan Africa to provide credit lines to domestic and regional banks for on-lending to SMEs. Under the 175 million euro East Africa COVID-19 response facility, two initial allocations were signed just a few weeks ago in Rwanda, one for 40 million euros to Bank of Kigali and another one for 15 million euros to KCB Rwanda. Also in this case, 30% of the loans will support SMEs led or owned by women or which meet the gender equality targets of the 2x challenge criteria. Since 2000, the EIB has continued its commitment to promote financial inclusion in Africa through our lending to microfinance institutions, which in turn provide access to finance to microenterprises. Our facilities take the form of equity and debt investment to microfinance investment funds, holdings and financial institutions. Recent microfinance operations in East Africa include a loan to Finance Trust Bank in Uganda, 5 million euros, which, like our previous operations with Pride Microfinance and Centenary Bank, support underserved Ugandan microentrepreneurs and women in particular. In addition, since 2007, the EIB has invested a total amount of 25 million euros indirectly through microfinance investment funds in East Africa. Also, the EIBs invest in private equity and venture capital funds that offer beneficiaries the possibility of using either loan or equity instruments and that benefit from management support. These instruments allow the bank to indirectly target companies in the startup phase or those in more innovative industries or entering new markets, which are generally perceived as very risky. Such investments create a strong leverage effect that catalyzes other investors in supporting projects in the region. We also encourage financial sector development through technical assistance programs which aim to build the capacities of financial intermediaries through dedicated training and coaching and improve the management and financial literacy capacities of their SME clients to ensure business sustainability. Recently, our capacity building support to banking institutions has increasingly been offered through annual regional academies, such as the banking forum we are opening today. Going forward, the EIB's future role will be even more impact driven. In fact, I am glad to inform you that the EIB's Board of Directors decided on the 15th of September to create a new development branch that will be responsible for its operations outside the European Union. This will enable the EIB to focus more on the development ambitions of our partner countries, to further support high-impact initiatives through dedicated strategies and better adapted policies 
including a differentiated risk appetite. The new branch will benefit not only from its own branding and identity, but also from its dedicated staff, including a stronger EIB presence in its field offices. Our aim being to strengthen cooperation with our partner countries, including regional and domestic financial institutions on the ground. Our first regional hub for East Africa that will consolidate 16 years of regional presence from our Nairobi office will be inaugurated during the forthcoming visit by EIB President Hoya to Kenya during the last week of November. On this occasion, I will also be launching the 2021 edition of the Finance in Africa report, which reviews financial sector trends across Africa, with particular reference on the impact of the current COVID pandemic. Let me to conclude by congratulating once again our close regional partners, Trade and Development Bank, and particularly its presidents and CEO, Admasu Tadesse, and the team of TDB Academy led by James Kabuga for their stewardship and the role they played organizing this important event. I value the contributions we are jointly providing to enhance human development and knowledge sharing. I look forward to seeing our partnership continue to build a more resilient banking sector across East Africa in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ostros, for those opening remarks. It is encouraging to hear about all the good work that the EIB is doing across the region to support the recovery, including the close collaboration with TDB to advance human development. And now it is time for our keynote address. Our speaker today is Professor Njuguna Ndongo, the Executive Director at the Africa Economic Research Consortium, a Pan-African premier research and capacity building network. A man of many talents, he's a former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya and an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Nairobi. It therefore gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Njuguna Ndongo to the podium. Welcome, Professor Ndongo. Thank you very much, and I feel very honored by the management of the Trade and Development Bank, as well as uh, the European Investment Bank, and this forum. And what I did was, I chose this forum to talk about the post-COVID economic recovery. And uh, it is going to be characteristic in terms of what I do currently, that is research for policy making, capacity building, but also my former heart in terms of uh, reading policymaker and regulator. But today I will avoid the regulation bait and talk about actually the, 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 the prescriptions in terms of where we're going, actually encouraging or even acknowledging where we have come from. So I'm very happy that uh, my friend, uh, uh, President Adimaso, I still call him president because I think this is quite consistent for turning trade, trade and development bank into an institution that we can look up to, the European Investment Bank. I've been in this uh, region for a long time and I'm very happy that um, we have seen the institution shaping up the economic thinking, not, even, not only for in terms of where we are going, but also trying to shape where we are coming from. So I'll be talking about the post-COVID 19 economic recovery strategy and everybody has talked about the devastating pandemic that has really gripped most of the countries in the world but the african scene is more devastating so i'll dwell on the, those aspects so that at least I, I can provide some information in terms of our, the new thinking that we really need to to borrow and maybe how do we define our future development path next slide please in the next slide i would like to talk about the AERC because I don't want to lose my job. But the most important point <laughs> I want to make here is that we, we want to make sure that the policy making in the African economies, sub-Saharan African economies is well advised. We also want to make sure that we build the institutional capacity that will help us in the future. But more importantly, that capacity building is very important because it is going to provide us with optimal policy choices that we can take 
And for me, it is very, very critical that we have that capacity at both the individual level and the institutional level that is going to provide the next phase. Next slide, please. I've chosen four areas to cover and to concentrate on, and it's because of their importance. And the first one is for us to come up with a strategy for post-economic recovery, uh, post recovery strategy. I think the first thing is actually ask ourselves, how do we protect private investments? And this is the target that has been devoured. This is an area that has been devoured by the pandemic. But the second one, and more importantly, is that the economy cannot recover if we do not protect, regulate, and develop markets. Now, we'll be worrying so much about that and why markets are very important, why markets are important in terms of the economic recovery. And the third aspect would be, I would talk about domestic resource mobilization because I want to look at this in terms of how we can actually have strategic choices that reduces the fiscal space that has been devoured by the pandemic for those countries that have them. But more importantly, how we come up with resolution of domestic and external debt in African economies. And finally, I'll be asking myself, I'll be asking myself and even trying to communicate across, asking us what kind of development model are we going to adopt? What kind of development path? What is going to coordinate that development path? And that is how we can ad ad adopt the digital evolution and the, the digital space that has been built in the last couple of years, 10 years or so, in the African economies to actually define the appropriate development path for African economies. The, second, the next slide, please. Having said that, let me dwell on protecting private investments. And what is the focus? Well, the focus is education, health financing, and health infrastructure, and even the nutrition outcomes. We have seen a bit of this. There's a lot of debate in terms of this. At the AERC, we have had so many uh, studies that are actually informing policy in terms of these aspects of human capital development. And the most important thing is that we'd like to reverse the effects of the pandemic while still building a very strong human capital development model for the region. We do believe that most of the models I will talk about, I will point out later, I'll be showing that most of the development uh, strategies that we have adopted in Africa have failed because of the inadequate capacity. And that is something that we can revise. The next slide, please. Let me dwell on the COVID-19. It has worsened the education gap in Africa. I've provided some evidence, but I will not dwell on the evidence, but it's just to show exactly what has really happened. And one of the first examples that I want to provide is the running gap in Africa and compare that to the rest of, to the, rest of the world. And how do we reverse this trend? It is going to involve a massive fiscal burden. So the next question is to ask, where do we get resources? And finally, we need to rethink human development capital, uh, human capital development model for the future. And for me, that is very, very critical to drive the process in future. Now, I'm also going to give examples why some of the previous strategies have failed just because they're not uh, uh, supported by the appropriate capital, uh, human capital development uh, uh, strategy or even um, uh, the model that is required. Next slide, please. The next one is actually to show to actually show that building human capital means requires a shift in policy and even investment. For example, on education, we need to reduce the dropout rates and improve education outcomes significantly. And across the divide, we have seen that we can actually move even for example, in the, at the beginning of the pandemic last year, the question was whether we are going to have discontinuities in our running processes. But those countries that were able to adopt the virtual uh, platform were able to do that effectively and efficiently. We at the AERC continue to provide graduate degree programs to public universities and even help universities to mount quality degree program, programs. And what we have done is actually shifted to a virtual platform that actually has ended up being very efficient and very inclusive. So it means that we can actually share that experience and it can be managed across, and especially for the digital evolution that is taking place. Next slide, please. The next slide, I will actually focus on how we can improve quality 
and the productivity thresholds in terms of human capital. And we do believe that improving the quality of education enhances long-term productivity of labor. We also showed, would show that with countries, countries with higher teacher pupil ratio than the median will reap large productivity gains. So this evidence tells us that we need to rethink about traditional approaches to education and training. We have had a project on human capital development in Africa, and we have to refocus on moving from education to health to nutrition outcomes. And we have been asking ourselves, what is the optimal uh, model that we're going to get? In the next slide, uh, I'm talking about also how we can actually improve on health uh, and spending on health services would not improve health outcomes. And this is a devastating outcome. Actually, it is effort that is more important in terms of improving health outcomes. And what we really need to, to do is actually to think about the strategies and how we can refocus effort rather than competence that is going to produce significant improvement in terms of health outcomes. For us, that is very, very important in terms of modeling. Next slide, I'm talking about what kind of policies for human capital accumulation and development in the region are quite appropriate. And we look at first in terms of skills development. And then what we really, what interventions do we need to involve? And especially for big economies like sub uh, like uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, what kind of labor market institutions are we going to dwell in? And how do we improve them? And how do we close the digital divide and even strategies in terms of adopting the digital technologies, the digital evolution that is coming in, and provide the appropriate interventions in terms of uh, what the advantage that we can take uh, uh, off from uh, this digital divide. I have provided examples in terms of how the financial system, and especially in the East African region, and now it is being copied across Sub-Saharan Africa, how the digital financial system has worked. It has shown that it can actually work and coordinate other sectors of the economy. So it means that rethinking domestic and even private uh, investment incentives, using even the digital platforms to coordinate that, because what we face is not only the lack of investment, but also coordination failure. And that for me is going to be very important for private investments, as well as coordinate uh, foreign direct investment policies that are going to help in terms of enlarging the scope. We do believe in the last couple of years, we have seen governments in Africa providing massive public investment. Massive public investment, especially in infrastructure, are very important in growing transactions costs in Africa. But more importantly, should be complementary to private investment. And where that channel of complementarity fails, then it means that most of these public investment will go to waste. But one of the it forced is that most of these public investments have been provided at a very, very high cost. So it means that to reap the benefits and even to appropriate returns from those investments will take us a long time. So it is a question of the thinking strategy. In the next slide, I now want to move into markets, an area that I'm very, very passionate about. And I am arguing that we need to protect, to regulate and develop markets. I've been a regulator. And I'm also been one of those people who emphasizes in emphasizes market market development. But what we really need to argue is that economic recovery will be stimulated and work through markets. Most important thing is that we have to develop markets. We have to support markets to function through better regulation and even protection. The role of a regulator is actually to nudge the market to the optimal path. The role of the, the regulator is not to wave an axe. And I used to emphasize that when I was in that area. But the most important thing about markets is that markets is where economic trends are shared and distributed. And participating in a proper functioning markets, as per the rules of the game, uh, will affect economic vibrancy or will, will support economic vibrancy and drive growth. And that growth can be felt. Those who participate in the market will feel the effects of the market because they can appropriate their returns or their returns to investment. And more importantly, the rewards system in the market will work when they are properly functioning. Private sector thrives in functioning markets, and it is the market that we can appropriate returns for your investment. If you cannot appropriate returns from your investment, then it is going to be very difficult for, uh, for, for you to participate in that market. In fact, one of the things that uh, I've seen even from 
America, President Biden, talking about is that one of the things for us economists, we did believe in the trickle-down effect. It is a narrative that we believed in, but we actually made a very strong assumption that markets would be properly, properly governed. If markets are not properly governed, then obviously you cannot, uh, uh, the trickle-down effects will not be felt. Markets rely on long-term strategy, and that is very important in Africa. We have seen so many African countries come up with long-term strategy. Rwanda with 2020, vision 2025, Kenya with vision 2030. For me, the most important factor of those visions is that it gives markets the right signals. It provides market with policy commitment or long periods of policy clarity. If you don't have that, then it means that it is going to be very difficult for you to actually uh, uh, participate in that market with clarity. In the next slide, I want now to move on to the next aspect that I said we have to refocus on domestic resource mobilization. This is a topical issue for me. And why it is topical issue? Because I do believe that the COVID-19 for those countries that had a fiscal space was wiped out, what was reversed. For those countries that didn't have it, they have gone into debt. For those countries that believed that the economic structure can work, have to start rebuilding from the scratch in terms of what is happening. That is why we are talking about debt, debt distress. The earlier studies that were conducted by ARC, by the African Economic Research Consortium, especially uh, uh, we presented that earlier this year, were showing that the last 20 years, the efforts of growth, poverty reduction, has actually been reversed the last 20 years. And that is grievous, so that we have seen poverty increase. But what we need to do, we need to perhaps come up with a domestic resource mobilization arch architecture that is going to support uh, the fiscal spending, the heavy fiscal spending that is required to actually reintroduce or refocus on, 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 on growth and poverty reduction. In fact, one of the celebrated studies that is still going on in the ARC and which we have presented uh, internationally, you know, is going to, it has been shared internationally, is actually revisiting growth, poverty, inequality, and now introducing redistribution. And we do believe in the current age that redistribution is a very strong uh, pro poor growth. But what we are focusing on in that uh, uh, research and the outcome is showing that strong growth is going to support poverty reduction. So how do we generate a strong growth? So essentially, one of them is that we have to change uh, the domestic resource mobilization and make it work. There are important outcomes here. We can recover the lost fiscal space. We can finance development because at the end of the day, the government must finance development. Even redistribution itself it has to be financed through fiscal space. And external internal debt, public debt resolution will have to come through the, uh, the, the uh, should I say, appropriate domestic resource mobilization. Above all, when I talk about domestic resource mobilization, I want it's a I'm, I'm looking at a family of um, uh, or a set of measures and appropriate tax instruments that can incentivize production and consumption. One of the biggest pitfalls in African countries is that to rely on a very narrow range of uh, taxes. And the, and the tax base is very, very narrow. And the tax effort is also very narrow. In an effort to do that, we actually uh, create distortion in the market. There are several examples that one can provide across countries in Africa. So what we really need to do first is to use the digital uh, payments infrastructure for tax payments. That reduces the contact between the tax taxpayer and the, and, and, and the tax authority. But more importantly, it is also uh, digital payments in terms of tax payments and as well as revenue administration will reduce the leakage that is uh, uh, available, comes in through this. So an appropriate domestic resource mobilization strategy should not distort the market and the price structure, but should support the market. So essentially, that's why I'm moving from the markets to domestic resource mobilization that will give us the um, avenue of even dealing with. Let me show some bit of evidence in the next slide. The next slide actually 
talks about um, uh, or shows the why we need to refocus on domestic resource mobilization. And one of them is actually how we reduced debt, especially starting with the in, the in the 1997, in the late 1990s with the debt restructuring, in early 2000, and the HIPIC initiative, debt forgiveness, and even debt restructuring. And we came down as low as below 40%. But now we have been rising. And when the pandemic struck uh, in, in, uh, around 2019, the, 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 the debt to GDP was about 60% on average in African countries. But now it has moved to slightly above uh, 70%. Now, what is happening here? One of them is that the low levels of development and even is going to contribute to low levels of, low levels of development and even economic fibers will be lower. We have to come down and how to, to reverse this to increase the capacity of the state and even state institutions to deal with the, 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 this manner. And of course, once you are distressed by debt, then you are going to have a narrow range of tax instruments. And even they're going, also going to be poorly designed that they do not generate their property income. I've looked around Africa and I've shown, I've seen that there are very few revenue institutions that have provided capacity to, for, for analysis to actually show how that tax instrument is going to generate income. And this is the pitfall. And that's why we believe in the building, building capacity. So essentially, we give several examples in terms of what will happen, especially when we have a very successful domestic resource mobilization strategy, and that is going to work very well. In the next slide, we are even focusing more in terms of appropriate structures that we can deal with. And um, some of them is, uh, uh, is actually to show the example in terms of where we are coming from and how we can go out of this. And we compare lower, mid, lower uh, income groups and even upper middle income groups in terms of how they're affected by different levels or how we can leverage the technology in terms of changing the structure of the domestic resource mobilization. For me, that is very, very important because finance, the finance, financing development and waking up and moving out of this pandemic and even having new strategies is going to be very, very important. In the next slide, I want to now to deal with the last subject matter which I do believe is going to be very, very important. And that is adopt the digital evolution to chart the development path. We have talked about so much about the digital evolution. We are clothing it with a lot of stake, but the most important thing is to ask where we have come from. I used to ask, why did the import substitution fail in the 1960s and the 1970s? The answer to so, so many people, development economists argue that the import substitution emphasized uh, capital intensity in countries with capital, with, with, with countries that had no capital, or they were capital scarce countries. But that is maybe part of one of the reasons. Maybe, maybe there are many other reasons. But the second one is that we also talked about economic transformation. Why did economic transformation fail in most African countries? Why? Because the capital accumulation thresholds were not reached. So it was going to be very difficult to ignite any structural transformation with raw capital accumulation. Mm -hmm. There are new studies that are coming up in terms of dynamic structural transformation and what is required. And that is very, very important in terms of trying to see where do we come from. And the third aspect, which is more recent, African countries trying to say, can we have an export-led growth? Can we mimic the East Asian miracle? And we have tried to do that export processing zones. Myself, I argued, why don't we turn the whole economy into an export processing zone, zone rather than an enclave? The bottom line is that East Asian Miracle was based on where I started, capital, capital, human capital development, strengthening institutions, and then we have a savings culture. And that is how investment uh, sorry, the export leg growth will, will succeed because you have an investment in critical sectors. You have specialization in critical areas and you have support in terms of institutions and government policies. So in a sense, we have failed in all those adaptations, the, 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 the examples that I've given. The next thing is to ask ourselves, where can we go from there? And we do believe that the digital evolution can chart the development path. Africa can chart its own development path, given its own adoption and endogenous development coming from the digital evolution.
So the economists in Africa should take advantage of the digital evolution. And it's, it, it has worked in some sectors like finance. They have succeeded in the financial system and digital financial services now needs to move to the real sector. And we have seen those examples coming up. The fourth industrial revolution will be driven by technology. And this is the time to ask ourselves, where do we tag on? What kind of investment do we need to cover? I've argued in, in different circuits about financial inclusion and I've argued that what we didn't need to make sure is that uh, financial inclusion means connectivity for all so that no, no one is left behind. But more importantly, we need to improve the state capacity or regulatory capability. You have to protect the markets. You have to nudge the markets to the appropriate directions. And that is going to be very, very important. The future development path will be coordinated by the digital technology in production, value addition, in markets, and even international trade. But I've also argued, and even at the level of uh, T20, we support an ARC is one of the T20 uh, think tanks in the, that support G20. And I've argued that trade will also be supported by a restructuring of, of the global value chain, because that is the only way we are going to fight downstream activities are going to be encouraged, including productivity, and upstream activities that also accompany incomes, in, 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 incomes will actually uh, uh, de determine the structure of the production processes in terms of efficiency and productivity. Finally, the digital evolution will coordinate all the other objectives, private investments, well, that's where I started, market developments, that's where I came next, domestic resource mobilization, that is the third aspect I was dealing with, and we can define Africa's development path. For us, that is the most important aspect, and we do believe we can succeed in the post-COVID era. The first slide, the last slide is actually to say, as we say in the East African region, Asante Sana, and because I was also trained in a different region, I could also say tax making. Thank you very much, and good morning. Thank you very much, Professor Ndongo, for presenting our keynote address on the post-COVID-19 economic recovery strategy. Uh, the keynote address explored a number of ideas relating to Africa's human capital development model and also highlighted four key areas to be considered as we seek to advance. These are the need to protect private investments, the need to protect, regulate, and develop markets, the need to refocus on domestic resource mobilization, and the need to adopt the digital evolution to chart the development path for Africa's economies. In line with the program, we would now take a refreshment break and then return for a panel discussion on the structure, performance, and recent developments across the East Africa banking sector. This panel discussion kicks off at 11.15 a.m. East Africa time, so grab yourself a cup of coffee and we'll see you right back here. Thank you. <laughs>